see everyone here today and I'm delighted to talk to you about the economics of virtual currency and Bitcoin. And this topic has been just an incredibly fun and exciting um, topic to research and learn about. It's emerged in, in the public imagination over the last two or three years as, as a, a key piece of technology that might really change the way finance works for consumers, for people in developing countries, and for the way that financial institutions actually conduct their business. So one of the things that's challenging about this technology is that there's so many details about it, about how it works. And just like in the early days of the internet, if you went to a conference about the internet, you would hear people talking about protocols and SMTP and FTP and how we get packets around. And really, none of the things that you would talk about in that kind of a technical environment would really be important for knowing whether you should start Amazon.com or eBay or whether you should uh, invent PayPal or whether Pets.com would succeed or fail. And so similarly for Bitcoin, a lot of the um, details of how the technology works can really be separated from what the technology is and what it does. And so what I want to talk about today is really what this technology is and what kinds of things it can empower. And then we can all sort of use our collective imaginations to think about where it's going to go. And just like having this conversation in 1993 or 1994, we could have very informed guesses based on economics and needs and shipping costs and warehouse costs and logistics and communication needs. We could make some very interesting predictions. Probably none of us would have realized how exciting YouTube or Twitter or you know, all these other things that people figured out to do later would be. And so in a similar way, we're not going to be able to fully forecast the best uses of this new technology. So at its really fundamental level, Bitcoin is something quite simple. Um, it's a spreadsheet. It's a big spreadsheet. Now you might think, well, wait, Lotus123 was invented in you know, around the 1980s. Uh, so what's new here? And in fact, really to think about the history of spreadsheets, we need to go back before they were called spreadsheets. Um, they were actually called ledgers. And so in the beginning of commerce, you know, in, in primitive economies, you might have learned in some class that people bartered you know, an apple for an orange or you know, a, a dead deer for um, uh, you know, a hunting knife. But in fact, that is really not how commerce emerged for the most part. Even in fairly primitive uh, societies use ledgers going way, way back in time. So it's, it's kind of complicated to actually have two things, one in each hand, and trade them for each other. And so it's been very natural for human societies to use ledgers to keep track of things so that I can contribute today and get something back tomorrow. So really the origin of money itself is a ledger. Before there was money, there were ledgers that kept track of who had what and who had contributed. So Bitcoin is, in its essence, a big spreadsheet or a big public ledger. And what it does is it keeps track of who has sent what to whom. So it's going to say that you know, person 123 sent one Bitcoin to person 456. Okay? That's what it does. And that's pretty much all that it does. So how can this be you know, so innovative and you know, so, uh, so exciting if that's all it does? Well, if you imagine for a second that we just put up a big spreadsheet that kept track of trillions of dollars and we just posted it on the internet from a server, what do you think would happen? So I might hack that server and try to change the ledger in some way. So if you're going to have a ledger that keeps track of things that are very, very valuable, it's very important that it's secure. Um, that's one thing. And so one, what the, I won't tell you how that works today, but I'll say that one of the big innovations in the invention of Bitcoin was a, a method to keep that ledger secure. And the, the, tech, the way that that's done is that there's actually not one computer that's holding that ledger, because pretty much any one computer is hackable, but rather copies of that ledger are kept all over the world. And they all have to agree, not all, a majority has to agree on what the correct ledger is. And so if any one or if even 20% or 30% of those were hacked or changed or altered in some way, that still wouldn't change the full public record. So this distributed technology, of course, only really enabled by the internet to, to be able to distribute something so widely and easily, is part of the security about of how this works. A second thing is that 
you know, if we wanted to have a big ledger to keep track of things, it would be natural to think about sort of having somebody in charge of keeping track of it. And so, you know, you could have PayPal. PayPal creates a big ledger. If you have an account on PayPal and you send it to someone else on PayPal and you're both carrying balances, no money actually moves. Just PayPal makes a debit on one side and a credit on another side and nothing else has to happen. But now you have PayPal, a company, that's keeping track of that ledger. Okay? The thing about uh, Bitcoin is that it's an open source software protocol that allows people to make their own entries on the ledger in a decentralized fashion. So if you own a Bitcoin, that means sort of two things. One is that you have the address for the Bitcoin and someone has sent it to you. So there has to be an entry on a ledger saying you have it. But that's not enough because you also need a security key or a password to authorize a movement of that Bitcoin to someone else. If you don't have the passcode, you can look out at that ledger and admire your beautiful Bitcoin sitting there, but you can't do anything with it. So you could say that you own it, but it's not really meaningful that you own it because you can't move it. If you have the password and you have an entry on the ledger that says it's yours, then you have something, a value that you can actually do something with. And what can you do with it? Well, exactly one thing. You can authorize a movement to someone else. Okay? But hopefully that person is going to give you something back, and that's what makes it useful. Okay? So that's it. Big public spreadsheet with some passwords and some really cool ways to keep it from getting hacked. All right. So why is that important and sort of uh, useful? Well, first of all, it's the first time that we have a purely digital asset where the whole definition of owning that asset is just the digital thing. There is no corresponding physical asset. And that's going to allow many things. Probably the, the easiest thing is just that I can send something of value to you digitally with the same kind of time frame and, and user experience as sending an email. That's something I can do globally. I can do it without asking anybody's permission, without requiring some other institution to do something for me. I can just do it. Information and contractability, making things easier and more frictionless, and allowing people to transact with each other without such a level of trust has enabled huge markets to grow where no market existed before. And digital money is going to allow that to happen in new services and applications, as well as making existing ones more efficient. So this is basically why I'm so excited about this technology. Not because I think you should speculate in Bitcoin and buy it at 300 and hope it goes to 1,000, but because it fundamentally, it's like the internet, a new technology that allows things to happen that couldn't happen before. And we have a whole range of some of the world's brightest entrepreneurs trying to figure out uh, what to build on it. The first wave of them may go bust, but eventually I have a lot of faith that the way that we move money is going to catch up with the way that we move information today. Thanks very much. Thank you.